senior pastor. Good morning, church. Uh, it's my first time to be in this assembly, and I really thank God. It's a beautiful place, beautiful people. Uh, here is the house of champions. Eh? <laughs> well, we are here to uh, appreciate that, and I love the Lord as my personal savior, and my name is Jacinta Carita, and I'm glad to be in your Mideast. Um, I can see my chairman <laughs> somewhere in life ministry, uh, Dr. Lucy. We are in the same boat. It's good to see you. Um, I was given a time just to pray for our senior, uh, for our deputy bishop as he shares the word, and let's pray together. Our precious and loving Father, we are grateful for this day that you have given us the life even to be in your house, to praise you and to honor you. As we sit in your presence, minister to our spirit, calm our hearts, open our ears, and we pray that we'll be the people that hear, perceives and understands your word, mm -hmm. that we may be saved. Amen. I pray for uh, the deputy bishop as he speaks your word. May you use your servant, dear Lord, to yes. communicate the truth this morning, to each one of us that indeed as we go home we will have received from you and we pray for your utterance your holy spirit to work through him in jesus name amen, amen. uh he has also asked me to read uh, the passage and if we can go together to the book of second kings second kings chapter 6 from verse 24 I trust we are almost there, but you can catch up with me in the interest of time. And I'll begin the reading from K King James Version. And it came to pass after this that Ben Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cub of doves dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him saying, help my Lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the winepress? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Then he said, God, do so, and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on his head this day. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elder sat with him. And the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head. Look, when the messenger cometh, Shall the door uh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door? Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What shall I wait? What shall I wait for the Lord any longer? We continue in in, in chapter seven. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall 
a measure of the fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Verse 2, then, then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, um, might this thing be? Uh, might, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat it thereof. The Lord bless his word. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. It's a joy to be here, and I thank God for the opportunity to come and uh, minister the word of the Lord today. I want to thank the senior pastor and the leadership of this church for giving me this opportunity to come and share with you the Lord's word. It's my first time to preach here, but I have attended a service here. Uh, so it's not my first time here, but it is my first time to preach. And I am grateful that the Lord has given me this opportunity to come and share with you. And allow me just to go to what has been read for us and share from it a few thoughts that God has helped me to gather. It was a time of difficulty in the land of Israel because it seems like Joram, who was the king, and Joram was the son of uh, Jezebel, and uh, many of us know that Jezebel was not a good woman, and uh, also the father was called Ahab. He was the one that was now reigning. The father had died and he was in charge. He seems to have been unprepared for battle. And uh, if you read the story of Joram, you will know that he was not a very good king. And the adversary, Ben-Hadad, who was from Syria, had invaded the land and had besieged the city of Jerusalem so that there was not enough food in the city. And not only was there not food, there was such a dire need among the people. The leaders were in need. You will find that when you read this passage, the people are in great need. Even the lepers, those that are most vulnerable, were in dire need. And we see that the famine is described to us in such a way that you understand that there was a problem. They were eating donkeys. And we are told that the soup from a donkey's head <laughs> was precious. Uh, I don't know how many of us eat donkeys, but uh, there, it was being sold. But more than that, it is that pigeons, you know pigeons? Pigeons dung, not the pigeon itself, but pigeons dung was being sold. And it was being sold at a high price. It was so bad that it came to a place where two women Two women conspired, let's eat our own children. You know, if human beings were to eat their, their own children, I would imagine that the fathers that are the ones that would do it. But a mother who has carried a child for nine months brought up a child to get to the place where they are saying, let us eat our children. Because we are told that two women conspired and they decided, today we will eat my child in any case, maybe they argued the child will die because of this hunger, and uh, tomorrow we will eat yours. And they actually did it. It was not that they were caught before they did it, but they ate one. Then the other woman decided, hey, hi, apana. Akachukua mtoto, akampeleka kwa show show. Or somewhere, we don't know. But she decided to hide her children. So you can see the need that had come upon the people. And this is very much like what has hit some of us. There are people who are seated here and they are desperate because of the things that have happened to them. Loved ones died. The effects of COVID have hit them in a big way. Some lost their jobs. In some families, it was the man and the wife that lost jobs and they had no means of making it. And they wonder, how can we make it? So this 
can be an example for us to learn from. How did they get out of it? And that's what I am praying that the Lord will help us. And I want to look at the different characters. Actually, we should have read all the way to chapter 7, verse 20. I will refer to it, but I will ask you to go and finish the reading from where we stopped. What we see is that Joram was passing the bag and he was blaming Elisha. He blames others. He was blaming Elisha for the adversity and it would seem when you read in chapter 6 verse 24 to 30, you see that he says, when he is told about these women that have eaten a child, he says Elisha's head will not be on his body by the end of this day. So he decides to send his messenger and he follows to ensure that Elisha is killed. Why is it that he is asking that Elisha be killed? I think it is because, or it would seem from verse 33 that was read for us in chapter 6, that Elisha had told him to wait upon the Lord. Because when he, came, he comes to Elisha's house, he says, why should I continue waiting upon the Lord? You know, the king said, and this is the B part, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And you know, in the situation that we have faced, there are people that may be asking the same question. Why should I continue trusting God? After I have been hit so hard by COVID, after I've been hit so much in that I lost loved ones that have died and I have been praying and I have been seeking the Lord, why should I continue? Even when the pastor quotes for us Isaiah 40 verse 31 and says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Why should I continue waiting on this God? And it is possible that it is you. It is also possible it's your friend that is saying that. And you're, so, you're joining Joram in saying, why should I continue waiting upon the Lord? Sometimes it is because we do not understand what it means to wait upon the Lord. To wait upon the Lord is to look to him in repentance, in turning to him. To wait upon the Lord is not to passively say, I am sitting down, I am waiting to see what the Lord is going to do. It is to seek him in prayer. It is to call upon his name. It is to ask him, Lord, what do you want to do in my life at this particular time? Oh Lord, where have I offended you? God had repeatedly spoken before this concerning the people of Israel that if you sin, I will punish you with hunger. I will cause you even to eat your own children. And if you read the times of Jeroboam, I mean Joram, and even his father Ahab, you will realize that these people had sinned. So when Elisha told them to wait upon the Lord, he was telling them to turn to God in repentance. And as God had said in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14, the chapter that we know very well, it says, when my people shall call upon my name and turn away from their wicked ways, I will even heal their land. I will take away the calamities. I will protect them. But it seems that these people did not realize. Brothers and sisters, when God says, wait upon me, it is that we turn to him in repentance and God has promised to forgive us. God has promised that he will come through for us. Could it be that the king thought that Elisha misguided him or could it be that he thought Elisha could do something but has refused to do something? Or is it that the king just wants to blame Elisha for no reason? Is it possible that even today there are people who blame the church, who blame, who blame God, and they don't know what to do because things are tough and they have come to church and they have been told that God is faithful, God is true, but they were not taught how to wait upon the Lord. 
I think the other thing that I want to note about this Joram is that he also blames God. Because when he hears the story about the woman, the women, the two women, uh, or the woman that came to him, he say he tore his cloth. But this tearing of his cloth was in anger against God. It, told, it tells me that even though inside it appeared like he was, you know, we are told that it was sackcloth that was inside his royal garments, it would appear like he was, you know, humbling himself. But to me, it is evidence of formalism and not genuine repentance and humility. Because his words were, why should I continue waiting upon the Lord? He even swears, uh, you know, uh, the Lord do me evil more than, you know, if the head of Elisha will still remain in, in his head. That was a swearing that I am going to do this. And you know, there are people who are just like this. They appear to be, you know, waiting upon the Lord, but truly they are not waiting upon the Lord. They are just doing the formal thing. They don't believe it in their heart. It doesn't come from the, the depths of their spirit. They just appear to be trusting in God, but actually their trust is in themselves. So what should we do? We should not go the way of Joram. We should not live like Joram. We should not pretend. And I'm saying this because I'm aware that there are many people that come to church. They appear to be okay. They appear to be holy. But as soon as they leave the church, the things they do, they do not reflect the nature or the character of God. And in line with our theme, they do not radiate the glory of God. My brothers and sisters, I am saying, if you want to be delivered, if you want to be set free from the vices that come in the world, you must learn to put your trust and confidence in God. And not just pretend, not just have the form. Paul wrote to Timothy and writing to him about the last days, and I believe we are living in the last days. He said that there will be in people, there will be people that will arise that have the form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They will act like they are believers. They will act, they will have the lingo, they will have the language, they will say buana asifiwe, but in the depths of their heart, they do not fear God. As a pastor of a number of years, I can say I have met so many people who in the, you know, from the outside, they appear to be well fashioned in the things of God, only to talk to them a bit more. And you realize that this person does not know God. You know, we should become like the, like the, the three sons of Israel who were in Babylon. And they said, that is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When trouble came and they were told that they would be thrown into the lake of fire, they told, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, they respected the king, but they told him that we will not worship your idols. We will not compromise. We will not give up our faith. We will hold on to the truth. Oh, that God would raise men and women that are like that. We have talked about Joram, but how did Elisha survive this onslaught against him. Elisha seems to be very confident. I want to say that his response is just what I have said. He continued in the fellowship of God. How can I say that he continued in the fellowship of God? We read that when he was seated in his house, while the king was out there and sending a messenger, Elisha told the people that were with him, see this son of a murderer, referring to the king Jeroboam, that he wants to kill me. He is seated in his house, but he is in fellowship with God so that God is revealing to him the things that are about to happen. This man is receiving a word of knowledge even before the king and his aide de camp, or the one that uh, we read was an officer, have arrived. 
You hear from God only when you are walking with God. And my brothers and sisters, I am here with just a simple message to tell you, learn to wait upon the Lord. Even in times of difficulty, learn to wait upon the Lord. The famine had affected everybody, including this Elisha. He was not living in another place. He was living in the very place where the famine was, but he put his trust in God. I don't believe he had excess food there. He was still in the same locality and was seeing what was happening, but he still held firmly in the Lord his God. He was genuinely walking with God. And when the king arrived, he had a thus says the Lord for the king. When the king arrived, he has received a genuine message from God for the king. Why? Because he has continued in fellowship with God. And I am saying, if we continue with the Lord, the church will have thus says the Lord to the society. We will have an answer. But if we are like Joram, we will just be reacting to things and making it worse instead of helping the situation. Like Elisha, we need to wait upon God for his timing because God has his timing. When Jesus went to the corner of Galilee for the wedding and Mary came to him and said that they have no wine, her answer or his answer Part of his answer was, woman, why do you come to me? In John chapter 2 verse 4, my hour has not yet come. And brothers and sisters, I want to be very, very clear. There is God's hour. God is sovereign. And God does not go with our dictates. We don't decide, God, now is the time you must do this for me. God is this hour that you must bless me. No. God has his time. If God did not have his time, then he would be our robot or he would become like our ATM. We go to him to draw whatever we need. But God is the one who is in charge and we must trust him and wait for him. There is this brother that has been praying for a long time to be able to get his family a place where he can call his own. And it has taken a while. I want to tell you, brother, hold on. God has his time. And in his appointed hour, he will come through for you. There is this sister who has been waiting upon God and saying, Lord, I want to get married. And he doesn't receive any applications. And when he receives application, it is by others who are already married. It is people that want to misuse her. Hold on and trust on God because at his appointed hour, he will come through. There are those of you that perhaps have lost everything because of COVID and you are wondering what will happen. And maybe you had heard a word from the Lord saying, it shall be well with you. I want to tell you, God is faithful. God is true. God is committed to his word. And whatever he has promised, he will make it to come to be. Hold on. Be like Elisha. Hold on, Banas, if you were. Look to God. Look up. There was a song that he used to sing uh, many years ago. Look up, look up. God is still on the throne. God is still on there. Whether it is raining, whether it is shining, God is still on there. Hallelujah. He has not changed. COVID or no COVID, we were taken by surprise. God is still on the throne. Drought or no drought, God is still on the throne. And talking about the drought that has happened in this country, I want to appreciate this assembly. You gave out of your abundance, out of what God has blessed you with, and you gave us abundantly. I understand there were eight bags, eight bags of maize that came from this church. God bless you. May he increase those of you that responded to that need. But uh, I want also to say, very important, that as we wait on God, make sure you are hearing the right word. So many people have lost it 
because they hear what is purported to be the word of the Lord, but it is the word of man. We have preachers who affirm things that they don't know. Just like the scriptures say that there are people who affirm things that they don't know. In the Old Testament, we read of prophets that steal one another's prophecy and they go and proclaim it. Here, maybe I'm talking to the pastors. Pastors, when you stand here, you're God's representative. Let it be that you have heard from the Lord. Don't stand here and say, tomorrow there will be a miracle. Every one of you will be healed and every one of you will have a car. That's a lie. And it is not of God. Provide what God has actually spoken and make sure that you share what is scripturally true. Elisha, as we will see, spoke the word that came from God. And the reason why we know that it came from the Lord is because it is fulfilled. So let's not, you know, let's not be tempted. We have seen some people standing, proclaiming things and prophecies. I don't know, maybe the, the, that doesn't happen in Eldoret. But where I come from, sometimes you listen, even on YouTube or whatever, you listen to a preacher and what he is saying, and you can say, this one is a liar, this one. But you know, because these are men of God, we don't want to say that is a liar. Just because he is supposed to be a man of God. You are not a man of God when you are lying. You're only a man of God when you have taken time to wait on God and you are speaking his word and you are his true representative. But it is not just the pastors. Even in the safari groups, when you meet, make sure what you are saying is totally true. It is backed by the scriptures. If you are a HOD, whatever you share, let it be true to the scriptures. Let us come against this, you know, spirit that seems to be prevalent in our land, that is promising heaven, while actually those people have not even gone to the, to the sky here. You know, heaven is further up. Hallelujah. May the Lord help us. Let us speak the word of God as it is. And sometimes the word of God is hard because sometimes the word of God will say, I will, yes, I will save you, but through the fire. In other words, you'll be allowed to go through the fire and you will come out victoriously. Sometimes God will take you through the floods. He says, I will save you through the floods. He also says, or we see when Paul is going for a missionary journey, he is going to serve the Lord and there is a shipwreck and he's part of the people that are in that shipwreck. But he knows that God has met with him and spoken to him and told him, I will spare your life and give you the lives of the people that are with you. You see, that's the beauty of having godly people. Because of godly people, you can deliver even others that don't know God. Paul was in that boat, and I, I trust that you have read it in the book of Acts chapter 27 and 28 when he's taking the journey to go to Rome. Those people were not looking to God, but because of the man of God, he, you know, Paul, God had told him, and he tells the people, not one of you will perish, but we will lose. He told them, but we will lose the sheep and the cargo. And indeed, I don't know whether everybody there knew how to swim because they never really got to the shore. But everybody, those who knew how to swim and those that didn't know how to swim, they got to the shore because of one man, one righteous man, because the Bible is true. The, the, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Availeth much in ensuring that a congregation like this can be saved by one godly person who is seeking, seeking the face of the Lord. But I also want to say, we need to be delivered from extremism. There are people who believe, okay, it is prayer, day, night, everything. And I know I have talked a lot about waiting on God. So they wait on God and they don't do anything. On the other hand, we have people who believe in themselves so much, it is what they will do that will save them. 
But brothers, we are told we are co-workers with God. You do what you need to do even as you wait on God. In this passage, when you read it, Elisha tells the people that he is with, when that person comes, shut the door. Keep the door closed. Don't open the door for him. If he gets here before I have delivered the word, I may not have the word to deliver. I may be killed. Do you get me? Elisha is waiting upon God, but at the same time, he is doing what he can do. There are people who are waiting on God and they are saying, God, give me this, but they are doing nothing about it. You pray and you go do what you can do. I hope I'm making sense to you. You must go and employ your hands in doing something so that God can bless the work of your hands. Actually, that's what the Bible says. He will bless the work of your hands. You have, if you have no works, what will God bless you with? You must go out and step in faith and you will find God walking with you. As I was on the way, the servant of Abraham said, the Lord led me. But I was on the way. I was doing something. I was making progress. I did not just sit idle. And there are people here. Let me see whether I can discern them. Some people here who are ever praying. And prayer is good. They are ever fasting. But they do nothing. And they say God has failed me. No, God has not failed you. It is you that has failed God because God has said, yes, pray. But after you pray, go and do something. And I could give you many examples in the scriptures. David prayed, shall I follow these people? And he was told, yes. And he goes to battle. It is not God who killed the enemies. It is David that followed and he was able to recover his family and those of, the, of his uh, uh, companions. Brethren, wacha niongee kama mzee. Sasa wacha niongee kama mzee. Vile ninasema ni hivi. Huwezi kusema wewe ndio kila kitu. Ndio alfa na omega. Sitaki Mungu, sihitaji Mungu. Wala huwezi kusema Mungu ndiye atafanya yote. You work with God. God will do what you can do. He will open the opportunities. He will raise the Lazarus. You've read the story of Lazarus. But you are the one to unwrap the Lazarus. When he raised Lazarus, he told them, go and unwrap him. There is something you must do. And we see it here. Elisha is telling people, make sure that the door is locked. Thirdly, on Elisha, he is keeping company of like-minded people. Very important. People who are speaking your language, people who understand you, people who have faith. This is why it is important to have fellowship of people who are telling you, God will come through for us. Not people who are telling you, ah, yes, let us give up. Let us give in. This God, he has forgotten us. Keep the company of like-minded people. And the English say, birds of like feathers, flock together. If you are a believer, walk with believers. If you walk with unbelievers, they will, they will get you to do things that you will live to regret. I, I need to move fast because my time is up. What were the results? And this is what you, we, we didn't read from verse, from verse 7 through to 20. The results were unprecedented intervention or unprecedented blessing that came. It seems to me that God is prompted to work when we trust him and when we do what is our bit to do. This time, he decided to magnify himself by taking some lepers that didn't know. Listen, Elisha is talking in his house with some people and he doesn't know how God will come through. 
but he has heard that God has said, tomorrow there will be an abundance of food. And he proclaims that. And Elisha believes it and he speaks it. As he is speaking, God in his own way decides to take some lepers that are outside the city. Lepers were ostracized. They were kept away from people. In fact, in those days, if you are a leper, you used to shout, I am a leper, I am a leper, so that if there is anybody coming, they can avoid you. But these lepers were outside the city wall. Food would be thrown to them, but because there has been famine, nothing has been thrown to them. And God uses that situation to cause the lepers to debate. And they say, if we stay here, we will die. But if we go to the enemy's camp, there is a chance they may give us something to do or something to eat. And so they decide to walk. And I imagine those lepers were not walking very, they, they were not walking majestically like this, the way I'm walking. Because when you have leprosy, one of the things that happens is toes, for example, could be cut. So, and maybe they have a problem of walking. Maybe they are walking and falling, but as they are walking like this, and maybe even falling, when they fall, God magnifies that fall. It appears like it is a bomb, a TNT bomb, to the, only to the ears of the people out there. The question is, do you think the lepers were hearing that thundering? No. They just thought we are doing what we can do. But God was magnifying what they were doing elsewhere. So they step here and there is rumbling in the camp of the enemy. And the enemies decide, hey, you go and read, it is there. It says that the enemy decided the king of Israel has decided to get another army to come and fight against us. And you know, the magnification of that noise was so much that these guys ran in a hurry. They left food, they left goods, they, hallelujah, hallelujah. God sometimes works, well, not sometimes, many times, he works in ways that we cannot describe. And he has no formula. You can't say that now, let's look for lepers. To walk. No. God has many ways of working. Nowhere else had God done something like this. But had we done miracles? Yes. Truly his ways are past finding out. They are beyond our imagination. And I want to tell you, some of you are seated here and you don't know what God is doing for you. He is making it possible for you to increase and to thrive. You, you think that you are just living, oh, life is going to be difficult. But God is at work. Hallelujah. And you will give us a testimony maybe one day. Apparently, God awaits for the proclamation of his word. When Elisha had spoken his word, when the word was proclaimed, he went forward or he went ahead to fulfill it. We should only proclaim the very word that God has given, lest we be found to be presumptuous. I think I had already explained that. And the blessing is multifaceted and holistic in itself. Let me say, for one, the blessing was a blessing to Elisha himself. Because the blessings of God start with the person who fears God. You know, in our mother tongue we say, ululations start from the home. And ululations is when people are happy. The people that celebrate you, it starts at home. And it seems God followed that so that Elisha was also blessed. His head was spared. He was not killed. If you read the Bible, you will find he continues to do his ministry. I want to say those who are faithful will not be forgotten. Those who put their trust in God, you will not be forgotten. But you will be a blessing beyond yourself. Because you will find that your enemies will be destroyed. Not that we rejoice over that, but if you read the story, the person who said, if God was to open the doors of heaven, I imagine that's how we were speaking. And people are like, is this food going to... This is my imagination. It's, you know, 
Is this food going to rain like Noah's rain? Eh hey, Mungu alifungua dirisha za bikuni kukanyesha watu wakakufa. Sasa chakula itamwagika namna hiyo. I imagine that's what that guy. He, wa, he really wanted to kill Elisha. But he was told, "Wait. You are scorning God and the man of God. You will see it with your eyes. But as for eating it, not at all." And it happened. So the enemy was killed. You know, just as the sun melts ice. And at the same time, hardens clay. That's also what happens to the word of God in our lives. There are people who hear the word of God and it brings faith. It provokes confidence and assurance in them. But there are those who hear the word of God and they are like this man. Those who are proud and self-centered, they become hardened. And they scorn and they scoff. Isn't that what Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3? That the church will be saying that Jesus is coming. And it is true. Jesus is coming. But there will arise coffers. Ah, tangu muambia kutuwa, muanza kutuambia hii yesu anakuja. Kwaani? Kuna jamu huko binguni. Kwaani gari yake ilipata accident. Hiyo hosi yake ilikufa. They may not use those words, but they scoff. But Jesus will come. And those who have held on to that will be saved and will be delivered. But those who have become hardened, they will suffer the consequences because choices have consequences. So the enemy actually is, he sees the people rushing for the food and there is so much food, so much food that the price just drops. The economy just thrives of the city. Watu wanakula I imagine because they had not eaten for a long time. Have you seen somebody who has not eaten for a long time? Anakuwa kama ana sindiria ingine ingia haraka. But they couldn't finish it because the enemy seems to have come with a lot of things. Bwana asifiwe. But when you also read the story, it's not just Elisha and the enemy and his enemy who was destroyed. And by the way, I want to say the enemy was killed by God. So don't go killing your enemies. Leave it to God. Amen? Vengeance belongs to? Don't take it upon yourself. There were others that were blessed. The lepers to start with, they went and found food. I imagine those lepers when they arrived in that camp. Kitu ya kwanza, waliketi. I don't know whether it was ugali or chapatis that were there. They ate. They ate. And ate. Then they said, hey, you know we have come from famine. <coughs> we will not just eat today. Wacha tuchukue ingine. Tufiche for kesho. Wakaenda wakaficha wakaona, hey, we tumefanya nyingi sana. Then they decided, ah, it's not fair. You know there were those people that were blessing us. When we, had, uh, when we were outside the city. Let's just go and remember them. So they decided on their journey to make a journey back home to the city to tell the people in the city there is an abundance of food. And go and read the story. The king is still skeptical. He does not believe that that is true. But there is somebody who has sense and he tells the king, why don't we send a horse? In any case, whether we believe it or not, if we stay here, we'll die. Let's send a horse, let them go and check. And they go and check, and they go beyond the camp, and they find it is true. And they come and report, yes, we went, we found those things were dropped. Yes, it is true. <laughs> and I imagine this, <laughs> these lepers were wearing bling bling. <laughs> because they found things, articles of gold that had been dropped. Can you imagine a leper? A meshiba, a mevaguo, a smart, a majeno labda, na bling bling. <laughs> and then the people themselves were fed and they had enough. I think even the lepers started having a different attitude. Before they were beggars, but now they were saying, Najua this city, were it not for us? 
you would all be dead. So they had an affirmation of their personhood because of what God had enabled them to do. And it all comes from a man who has put his trust in God. May there be found a man that puts his trust in God. God may be using you to be a blessing or God may be answering the prayers of somebody who prayed. You are being blessed like these people, but it is because the prayers of somebody else. Some of you, and I know for sure that there are some, you are so blessed because of the prayers of your mother or your father. Perhaps they have even left or your grandfather. They were faithful before God and they used to seek his face and they said, Lord, would you bless my generation? And you are receiving that blessing and you are oblivious of the fact that it is God that has come through for you. The people in Jerusalem, many of them may not have known where the blessing originated. It was because of the faithfulness. And I also want to say, if that can be the case, you can start praying for your generation and believe in God that he will raise great and powerful people in your genealogy because of your prayers today, because of your trust in God today. The lepers, I have said, were ignorant of the conversations that had taken place in the city. They did not keep the good news to themselves. They shared with others. And we too need to go and share the good news that we have received with others and become a blessing to them. I also want to say that God, by grace, provided for his undeserving people, but more importantly, he kept his word. I want to say we are here courtesy of God's grace. We are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. But God, in his grace, has saved us, has delivered us, has allowed us to be alive, have allowed us to go through that season that was very difficult, and we are here. That is his grace. But more than that, God is faithful and has kept his word to us. We need to look to him and trust him and believe him. If you are one of those people that you are facing a situation like this, maybe you are like Joram, you need to change. Maybe you are called to become like Elisha. Keep company of godly people. Continue trusting in God. God will come through for you. Maybe you are like the people that were in the city. God is answering the prayers of others and you are being blessed. And I would want to encourage you to join the company of those that look up to God. God will come through for you. I want to pray that you will be encouraged. Refuse the lie of the enemy that you must be stressed because that is what the enemy is telling us, that we must be stressed. Elisha had reason to be stressed, but he decided to look to God and God take away, took away the stress. This stress has caused even people who are not necessarily, you know, are supposed to be suffering mental illness. Talking about mental illness, it has become a big issue. And there are people who are predisposed towards that. There are people who are medically sick in that. But there are people who are not. But because of the stresses of life, they are going towards that direction. I want to say, if you are one of those people that is not predisposed towards that direction, hold on to God. Trust in God. Walk out of this place saying, I will put my faith and my confidence in God and I will not allow myself to be mentally distressed because God is still on the throne. God bless you. Senior pastor, come and pray for us and dismiss us. <laughs>